Uh, welcome to our uh, Catholic Civics Workshop on Catholicism and Progress. Um, like I said, this is such a critical topic, and we're so lucky to be joined by two people whose um, professional expertise and insights as thinkers and theologians, I think, are, is just a hugely, hugely insightful for this topic. And so I'm going to take a moment and introduce both of our guests, uh, starting with uh, Professor Douglas Farrow. Uh, Professor Farrow is a Canadian citizen married with five children. Before coming to McGill in 1998, he taught in the UK at King's College London after completing his doctorate there under Colin Gunton. At McGill, alongside his lecturing and graduate supervision, he has served on the university's academic policy committee, as on numerous faculty or school committees, and engaged in the work of the Newman Institute. He pursues a broad range of interdisciplinary interests anchored in theology with colleagues here and elsewhere in North America or Europe. Uh, S.S. S. Paul, Irenaeus, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, and John Paul II provide much of the inspiration for these labors, which have a dual focus on classical theological loci and modern problems in the church or in civil and state institutions, including the university. Professor Farrow, thank you for joining us tonight. My privilege. And our second guest is Mark Shea. Mark is a popular Catholic writer and speaker. His works include The Church's Best Kept Secret, a primer on Catholic social teaching, which just came out last year, Mary, Mother of the Son, Salt and Light, The Commandments, The Beatitudes, and A Joyful Life, The Heart of Catholic Prayer, Rediscovering the Our Father and the Hail Mary, and The Work of Mercy, Being the Hands and Hearts of Christ. He is also the author of Making Senses Out of Scripture, Reading the Bible as the First Christians Did, by what authority an evangelical discovers Catholic tradition, and this is my body, an evangelical discovers the real presence. An award-winning columnist, he has contributed numerous articles to many magazines. Mark is known nationally for his one-minute words of encouragement on Catholic radio. He also maintains the popular blog, Stumbling Toward Heaven. He's an internationally known speaker on various issues in Catholic faith and life, and he lives in Washington State with his wife, Janet, and their sons. Mark, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. So as always, we're going to start with an opening prayer, and then I'll pass the mic to Peter to, to get the conversation started. So if you'll all join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For our prayer this evening, um, today is the feast day of St. John Vianney, uh, who is the patron saint of priests. And though it's a little disconnected from our topic tonight, it feels like an appropriate time to pray for vocations in our church most especially for the priesthood at a time when vocations are very challenged, particularly in North America. And as our prayer tonight, I thought I would read just a short reflection from St. John Vianney on the Christian life and living a Christian life. Our God no more loses sight of us than does a mother of her child that is beginning to walk. My God, cried Moses, show me if it pleases you, your countenance, then shall I possess all things that I want. How consoling for a Christian is the blessed thought that God sees him, that God witnesses his sorrows and his troubles, that God is by his side. What is still better, God presses him tenderly to his heart. O Christian people, how happy are you in the enjoyment of so many privileges? Am I not right when I say that the presence of God is an endless happiness for the good Christian? It is heaven upon earth. St. Bernard assures us that there are three mysteries upon which he cannot meditate without feeling as if his heart would break with love and sadness. The first is the mystery of the incarnation, the other that of the passion of Jesus Christ, and the third is the most adorable sacrament of the altar. And together we'll pray a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, oh, grace. Lord, Lord is with thee. With thee. Blessed art thou blessed amongst women, among women, and blessed, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, of God. Pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. And with that, I will turn it over to my co-host, Peter Copeland, to get the conversation started. Hello. Thanks, Brendan. Hello, Mark. Hello, Professor Farrow. Really looking forward to this discussion. Um, you're two great uh, voices who, who will add uh, a great deal of uh, insight and, and charitable um, insight on on that on what is a you know a vexed uh, issue. Um, it, it's a term you know progress that we we hear it everywhere. Everyone has a different idea about um, what it means. Probably an unexamined one. It's very much front and center um, as, as well, kind of ideologically um, on on all sides of the political uh, spectrum. So um, 
we want to get a sense from you before diving into kind of just how it's used out there today, what it what it means from a from a Catholic perspective. So, in in your view, what do you think are its different aspects? And could you touch on how we ought to understand it theologically and on a philosophical level, Professor Mark? There. Professor, you want to go first? Uh, certainly, yes, I can. So. I think it can be put fairly simply in these terms, creatures as such, that is, as beings brought into existence, have a, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's, it's their very nature to advance. Uh, <clears throat> whether they're headed in the right direction or the wrong direction, they do advance. That is, they make progress in good or in evil and in various uh, ways in terms of developing their natural gifts. So um, theologically, we think of the ultimate goal of the human creature uh, as, as, a, as a arrival at the um, God who brought the creature into existence and as an eternal sharing in the in the uh, life of God, which will be a kind of, uh, some theologians say, and I think rightly, uh, amongst the fathers as well as modern theologians, will be a kind of eternal progress because the giving of God is inexhaustible. So there, you know, that in a in a, in brief compass is is a theological approach to the idea of progress as something inherent in the very um, gift of being brought into existence. Uh, yeah, uh, I would certainly, uh, agree with, with all of that. Uh, one of the things that when I was thinking about it was, was that progress in the Christian vision means conformity to the image of Christ. Uh, it become, it means becoming more and more like Christ. Uh, and that is something that is, uh, like and yet not like what our secular understanding of progress is. Uh, our secular understanding of progress is moving forward, ever forward. Uh, and that's the assumption that's behind that is progress is always good. And as uh, Professor Farrow notes, progress isn't necessarily always good. You can also progress in evil. Uh, you you can attempt uh, to uh, you know bu build uh, the Tower of Babel was a kind of progress as well, uh, mm -hmm. and yet um, came to nothing. And so, what we have to ask ourselves whenever we we speak about progress is what are we progressing toward? Uh, and what we seek always is uh, we, we seek for the individual uh, a certain kind of progress, progress in holiness, in becoming more and more like Christ, in becoming uh, able to love more deeply, uh, which is a struggle. Uh, because, you know, what does Jesus call us to do? He calls us, among other things, to love our enemies. That's really, that's really hard. Uh, and often it feels like you're going backwards uh, when you attempt to do that because we fail so often. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's that. But there's also the fact that progress has to be something communal uh, in the Catholic vision. We are none of us saved alone. Uh, we are saved as part of a body. Uh, and that body uh, can't simply be concerned with itself. Uh, we are called as the body of Christ to be leavened for the whole world. Uh, and so we're called to work uh, with all people of goodwill because uh, as the Orthodox say, we know where the church is. We don't know where she is not. Uh, so the church extends uh, off the borders of the map in some ways. Uh, we, we can see the visible church, but we also know that the Holy Spirit is at work 
uh, in the lives of people that we may not connect with the church at all. Uh, and those people, too, are called to progress with the church. Uh, and ultimately, all of, all of the human race is called to progress uh, with the body of Christ toward the kingdom of God. Yeah, very insightful comments. I wanted to pick up on one thing you said there, Mark, before we move on. And you said, you know, it can feel like you're going backwards sometimes when mm -hmm. you're trying to love your enemy as yourself. And um, I think when we think about that, we recognize maybe that that's a point of difference with a, a secular conception and mm -hmm. uh, a, a Christian conception. Um, I want to get your your thoughts on that. Um maybe using that as an example to kind of draw out what some of the differences are. And uh, Professor Farrow, happy to hear your thoughts on that as well. Right. Uh, well, it, it seems to me that the, the theological vision of progress that I tried put uh, briefly a moment ago is also at the root of many um, of our secular, so-called secular perspectives on progress. Um, I mean, it, it, the, the notion of progress that developed during the Enlightenment uh, came, you know, had its, had it, had it, had its seedbed in, in the writings of, of Lessing and to some extent Kant. And Lessing took up a, a notion from Joachim of Fiori, uh, who, uh, you know, as you will know, was was uh, an abbot and uh, and a mystic of sorts, who who hoped back in the um, 12th century for um, a time when when society would be led by truly spiritual people and would make uh, uh, enormous progress in the realm of, of the spirit, which would also uh, lead to other forms of progress. And Lessing uh, in the 18th century thought, well, you know, he was just ahead of his time, this fellow. Um, and building on the uh, scientific revolution. Uh, there was a lot of optimism about human progress, and so um, the the notion that society as a whole was making tremendous advances and would continue to do so gained a lot of currency. Um, the the, the so-called myth of progress is is stems from that same period and that same kind of thinking. That is, progress is something in which we should all believe, and it should inform our view of the world, our outlook, um, and our determination to keep moving forward somehow. Um, so, I mean, if, if if any of your audience wants to to read about the development of of that sort of thinking, uh, John Passmore wrote a very good book back in 1969 called *The Perfectibility of Man*, which uh, begins long before Joachim, uh, but works its way right up to the modern period, showing. How, how various thinkers have promoted an idea of intrinsic progress in the human being and the human race. Uh, secularized, that is, stripped of some of its theological components, uh, but still um, in, in some fashion or other in touch with, with its theological uh, roots. Mm -hmm. uh, when I speak of... like the the sensation of going backwards uh that's it's the th it's the thing that makes us reluctant to go to confession uh you know going and admitting it, because of course when we go to confession usually we're going to confession for the same bloody thing we went to confession for last week or last month, you know, uh, most of our struggle with sin is struggle with besetting sin. 
uh, and there's nothing more discouraging than besetting sins. Uh, the you know when you have to keep going back and saying, "Here I am, I failed again uh, at the same stupid thing I failed at last time." Uh, this is something that afflicts us not only as individuals, but it it afflicts us uh, as whole societies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we are currently in the throes, for example, uh, in the United States of confronting yet again our long, long, interminable history of racism in the United States. And we have the same, we keep going back to the same struggles and the same patterns of denial. Uh, and what lies behind those patterns of denial, of course, is the sense that if I admit this, I am admitting weakness. And the weak cannot progress. Only the strong can march forward into history. Uh, the insistence of the gospel is when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, it's when I admit uh, my faults and my my need for grace and my failures. That's when you know, as as uh, as the song says, um, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And this is who we are as Catholics. And it's it is not just countercultural. It's just against the grain of fallen human nature to ever want to admit that we're weak and in need of grace. Uh, but that is exactly how progress happens. And so the paradox of the Christian tradition uh, is, is precisely that weakness before God uh, is the basis for progress, for spiritual progress, uh, and ultimately for civilizational progress as well. If we, if we apply a secular analysis to the life of Jesus, um, it was a failure. It ended in crucifixion. Uh, if we look at the life of every one of the apostles, um, they died in ignominy. Uh, you know, with their heads being cut off or, or crucified upside down or all these other things. And yet, the, as, as Tertullian said, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church that seeming failure, uh, that humility before God, that willingness, if necessary, uh, to lay down one's life rather than to, you know, proudly march onward uh, toward uh, power and the, you know, the mastery of all the kingdoms of the world is precisely the way uh, of Christian progress. Uh, and a kind of a side effect of that uh, as Jesus says, is as you seek first the kingdom, then everything else is added as well. Um, so, yeah, great answers, both of you. I, I want to get um, a little more sense of what this, some more common secular perspectives on on progress are. Professor, you mentioned you know this this drive for perfectibility in our our own lives and mark on, you know, kind of uh, dominance and, and power to, to a certain mm -hmm. extent. And get from, from both of your thoughts, what are, what are some other common uh, secular perspectives on progress and where do you see them? Maybe what are their intellectual roots or historical roots? I'm not sure uh, how far the drive for individual progress and perfection goes obviously it's different for different people some people are 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 as we say driven and others not so much mm -hmm. um, but the notion of of progress as a corporate or collective experience of humanity i think has has its roots in in the in the process I was describing earlier, um, the the sense of triumph over the forces of nature that were produced uh, by the scientific revolution, uh, which by the way had its roots in Christian thinking about creation, about the world being being called into being out of nothing. Without that concept, the the scientific revolution would never have got off the ground. Uh, it would take some time to explain that, but uh, um, but but that actually is the case. Um, and uh, but but once it did get off the ground, and 
um, and so much success was had in, in relatively short order. There was a tremendous wave of optimism that that spread through Europe, um, and the discovery of the New World, which was taking place at the same time, a little earlier, uh, had also created all sorts of optimism about new wealth and new 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 uh, prospects for um, uh, the growth and uh, of of cultures and of empires. So so we. We have, you know, in the last 500 years, lived through uh, a period in history that, in in many respects, um, is unprecedented. Obviously, there were times of advancing empires, advancing cultures, and and advancing technology of a sort. But there's been nothing quite like what we have seen. At the yeah. same time, we've seen. Uh, uh, all of this used in ways that have been um, trem- uh, tremendous avenues for progress in evil, progress in in repression and suppression and persecution of peoples, mm-hmm. uh, in raping and pillaging of civilizations and even of the planet. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that I think has created a, a, a quite um, strong existential conflict, not only in individuals who are always prone to that, uh, but in society as a whole. And and so the myth of progress has met with, lately, as since, since the Great Wars in particular, uh, and since we began worrying about the effect of our technology on the planet, uh, it's met with a great deal of angst and uncertainty as to whether we can, in fact, put our confidence in this idea of progress, capital P, perpetual, uh, natural, um, and and uh, and good in every respect. Yeah, uh, there's a fiction writer, a uh, guy named Michael Flynn, not the Trump White House guy, but another guy. Uh, and, uh, he's written some very interesting stuff on, he's a, he's a Catholic and he's written some very interesting stuff on the, uh, the rise of the sciences, which he argues. And I think very persuasively that the rise of the sciences happened in the womb of medieval Latin Europe and what's necessary for the rise of what we call the sciences, the natural sciences. And this, by the way, is another uh, example of seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added as well, uh, is that what the Christian tradition was established, particularly in the Latin West in, in, during the medieval period, was established the ide- two ideas. First was uh, the universe operates according to knowable laws because there is a lawgiver. Uh, And the second, and that's something that we share, by the way, with the Islamic tradition. Uh, But what the Islamic tradition didn't do and what the Latin West did do uh, was the Latin West insisted on the reality of what are called secondary causes. So what brought me into being? Well, God brought me into being, but God didn't bring me into being directly. He used a whole line of secondary causes that, that, you know, you can tr- trace back to the Big Bang and most recently to my parents uh, and choices that they made. Uh, and that's why I'm here. And because of that, because of that insistence on secondary causes, which is a kind of an epiphenomenon of sacramentality, uh, uh, what the Latin West did was it said, you know what, we can study those secondary causes. Uh, God doesn't directly do everything. Instead, he works through creatures. Uh, And we can trace the relationships between the creatures we call time, space, matter, and energy. And that is where the sciences came from, uh, is that conviction that that was possible to do. And because of that, you got the rise of the sciences with the spectacular uh, 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 benefits that have come from that and and we shouldn't sneeze at that as christians and you know rush off to say well there's all kinds of problems with the sciences sure of course there's problems with anything anything can be misused uh but you know uh 
we have we have not had famines, uh, natural famines. We can have and have had uh, humanly created famines. So, for example, Stalin's uh, enforced famines uh, during the 30s. Uh, and, and you can, you can certainly point to that. You can point to Zyklon B, you can point to, uh, nuclear weapons and that's all, uh, absolutely real. But at the same time, uh, we're having a conversation right now, uh, while I'm sitting in Seattle and you're sitting in Toronto and professor Farrow is uh, sitting wherever he is, and we could do this and, People can listen into that discussion. And that's the paradox uh, of progress. Uh, uh, as somebody pointed out to me, what the sciences have allowed us to do is, among other things, build a network of satellites so that we can create, uh, that circles the globe so that we can create an internet whereby the Flat Earth Society can put out uh, <laughs> bulletins on the internet announcing that there are members of the Flat Earth Society all around the globe. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the paradox of progress uh, is you can have that forward motion and it really is a huge revolution in human communication that we can do something like this. This something that was unthinkable 20 years ago, the average person was just barely beginning uh, to understand the possibilities of the internet. Uh, and at the same time, now we've got, for example, we have a pandemic that was made possible by a global transportation network. We also have a pandemic uh, that has been if only human sin would not get in the way of it, we could eliminate that pandemic with vaccines that have been created by science. But because of a global uh, social media network, we now have a massive disinformation campaign that is talking people out of taking a vaccine that will save millions of lives. And that, again, is one of the weird paradoxes of progress is you can move forward technologically and at the same time move backward morally because people are, you know, choosing to remain ignorant or uh, being lied to or, or whatever. So it's a very strange, uh, you know, a, a flow and eddy uh, in this river that we call progress. Very interesting. You, and you both um, drew attention to the fact that um, this ability um, now to to master uh, nature through through secondary causes, as I guess we could put it, um, was very much um, born out of the um, you know the Christian understanding of the world, mm -hmm. and um, gives gives great benefits and and also um, some drawbacks and. I want to um, press this a little bit to try to differentiate what what you think um, is secular from Catholic and Christian uh, understanding of of progress is, and we already alluded to uh, to it at the beginning, um, Professor Farrow, by laying out kind of the, the story of of, of creation, um, the fall, and, and redemption. Um, so we recognize the role of providence in the history of world in the world, and and stress living in a certain way based on that. Uh, what is to come in in the afterlife? To to what extent do you agree with this portrayal um, of distinguishing or distinctive of uh, of the Catholic understanding? Um, and how do you think? this underlying difference in perspective colors the different ways of, of approaching the, the question of progress, the imminent frame to the, um, the, the religious frame. That's a difficult question for a number of reasons. First of all, the, the idea um, that is operative from Genesis to revelation in in biblical terms that uh, that god is the author of life he's the author of existence um 
and that he is the author in a deliberate and and um, beneficent way. Uh, we didn't have to be here. Nothing needed to be here. God is sufficient to God's self. Um, but God in his goodness and his great power uh, brought us into being. It follows from that, and it's always evident in those same scriptures and in the theological traditions that flow from them, that that the good God who created the world and made it good um, is going to take good care of it. So providence is is a way of thinking, you know, the doctrine of providence is a way of thinking about the good creator's goodness on an ongoing basis in the world that, uh, and the universe that, that he's made. So, um, when you, when you get to, to, um, visions of progress that, um, though they can't detach themselves altogether from those theological roots do do their best to be detached. Uh, we could talk about how that happened in the Enlightenment, um, particularly around the idea that progress in human thinking will be enhanced if human thinking is not dependent upon um, inspired sources in in the sense of being dependent on their authority, but only rather on their um, uh, inspiration in the more poetic sense. Once you get to the idea that progress is is basically a human creation, uh, working with the stuff of nature, but but being able to manipulate it to overcome it. Um, then you get um, you get to a sense of of the greatness of of the human being and of the powers of the human race, which leads to an interest in what humans can do for themselves, as you put it, within the imminent frame, to use my colleague Charles Taylor's term, um, and and less attention to to what it means to be a creature who's who who not only can't have endless ends as as uh, Aristotle or Aquinas would say but who who very definitely has God the creator as his or her end and whose progress is primarily determined um by the uh willingness to pursue that end wholeheartedly uh so um, there then there then grows up um, a, a secular version of the old medieval struggle between, and even even patristic struggle uh, between progress in civilization in this world and progress towards the the glories of the kingdom of God, which will come and will be an eternal kingdom, not merely a temporal or provisional one. Um, so. Uh, in in the in the modern context, that tension is reduced to what we might call forward progress of society and of science um, and technology and bureaucracy and so forth, and the internal progress of the human soul and the the will to to autonomy and to authenticity. So it it becomes a, a tension really between the individual and the state um you know that seems to be the focus of it and we're we're at present wrestling with that on all sorts of levels uh legally um and uh philosophically and even if we were to come back to the pandemic uh, which i would interpret in radically different terms than what uh, marche just did uh we can see it at work there too um so so the same the same vertical horizontal um contrast but but played out in very different ways depending on whether the vertical actually leads to god or does not mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of things uh that i'm struck by uh in terms of recent developments uh 
in church teaching by recent, I mean within the last 50 years. Uh, the first is that the Second Vatican Council uh, spells out something for the first time <laughs> in the history of the church at the Second Vatican Council. It's very clearly, it's a response to the 20th century uh, and to the you know, the catastrophic Himalaya of corpses that the 20th century piled up. Uh, the church teaches, uh, I believe it's in Gaudium et Spes, uh, that uh, man and woman are the only creature on earth whom God has willed for their own sake. Uh, that's a really, it's a striking definition. It's, of course, it's latent in the tradition all the way back to human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, but it's the first time that the church spells that out uh, is 50 years ago. And the point of that, which the church really has yet to absorb, I think, is one of the weird things about uh, developments of doctrine. We see this, for example, in the book of Acts. Uh, is that the church, median council, under the uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit, can articulate things which the church herself does not, or the members of the church themselves don't fully comprehend. So Peter will say at the, at the uh, Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works of the law. Uh, and then the council will adjourn and he will go off and immediately forget what he is, he himself has taught and go to Antioch and start not hanging around with Gentiles and keeping kosher and doing all of these things that he himself just said were not necessary to do. Uh, because when the church speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is speaking beyond itself. Uh, and so it, it often takes the church like 100 years to implement a council uh, because they don't know what they're saying when they, when they teach. It's, it's a very strange paradox. And so one of the things that we saw the church articulate was this insight that no human system is superior to the good of the human person. Every human system, uh, whether it's military or, or scientific or governmental uh, or social or ecclesial, exists for the human person. The law is made for man, not man for the law. Uh, and yet, of course, as we've seen in the last 10, 20 years, uh, the church forgot that and told sexual abuse victims, for example, you exist for the system, not the system for you. And so the church had to learn the hard way, the truth of its own teaching in Gaudium et Spes. But that is a hugely important insight that uh, it's the human person that's at the center uh, of God's purposes. Uh, at the same time, the human person is intimately tied up with the rest of creation. So in Genesis, uh, what the human person is revealed to be uh, in the creation narrative of Genesis is a kind of a priest king, a priest queen, who is uh, supposed to exercise a kind of sub-creative dominion over creation uh, in union with the work of God. So we are helping creation along. That's part of what is being shown by Adam uh, tending the garden and so forth. And this is part of our mission. But of course, as fallen creatures, what we also do uh, is we disrupt that mission uh, and we do damage to creation. And so one of the things that Pope Francis talks about in Laudato Si uh, is that we can, there are a number of things that we can do with creation that are deeply destructive, you know, so we think, for example, of pollution and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the insights that he has, which just blew my mind when he pointed it out, I've always thought of uh, idolatry, for example. I had always, until that encyclical, thought of idolatry as, as an insult to God, of course, uh, but also as uh, something that damages us. But one of the things that Pope 
Francis pointed out, is that idolatry also does something else enormously damaging. It puts an intolerable burden on the idol to attempt to be the God that we want it to be. So think, for example, you know, of the, of the superstar or the rock star who winds up, or, or the wealthy guy who winds up committing suicide. Uh, think of a Hitler, for example. Uh, no small part of Hitler's crime was that he really tried to be the God that he lied that he was. Uh, and it destroyed him as well as destroying 50 million other people. Uh, and that was a kind of an act of idolatry. And we can do that with creatures as well. We can put all kinds of intolerable burdens on creatures. And of course, we can, as we're doing right now, you know, burn down the world. Uh, because the four big idols uh, that we are always tempted by and have been the four idols that the human race has been tempted by for time immemorial are money, pleasure, power, and honor. Those are the big four. Uh, the pagan idols that Israel condemns were all in one way or another a, represent a representation of those four things. Uh, and we are inveterate in our desire for those idols instead of the God of Israel, uh, because those things promise us happiness, uh, or we promise ourselves happiness uh, uh, in ways that will never involve us having to bear the cross. Uh, and, and so as we seek to understand what progress is, it's very easy, of course. When things start working well, as one of the many side benefits of, of, of technology has been, is technology says, you, you did it. You're not, you're not going to have to uh, suffer or be poor or uh, deny yourself in any way. Uh, technology tells us you deserve a break today. Uh, and it's oh, fantastic. We can finally put that part of the Christian tradition behind us. Uh, and of course, what that really means is someone else is going to take up the cross for us because we're going to start, you know, we're going to go to some third world sweatshop and we're going to say, you do this, uh, terrible work that I don't want to do so that I can, you know, I can have a, a nice cell phone or, or whatever. So. I, I want to ask on this in this notion of um, we've talked a little bit about um, progress as a movement toward God or as a movement toward evil. And, and that word can be used rightly to describe both of those movements. Um, I want to ask you both about a concept, I think, that is on a lot of Christians minds when they think about a Christian idea of progress and how relevant is it in the the let's say the earthly world versus how much it is something that is in the world to come. And that concept is the kingdom of God. Um, and, and I think there are kind of one of these beautiful both ands of Catholicism is that the kingdom is both something that will never fully exist here today among us because of that fallen nature of man that we've touched on in so many different ways in this conversation, that mm -hmm. the, the kingdom in its fullness is only something that will happen that is in heaven with God and in God's presence. But right. at the same time, and I might not use the right words here, but at the same time as Christians seeking to live out God's plan of salvation, we have some obligation to try and, I don't know if the right word is imitate, to build, but to make manifest some aspect of the perfection of the kingdom in the mm -hmm. world today. And I don't think these are necessarily ideas in tension, but I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on to what extent is the kingdom something we can progress towards in this life as a society, whether that be in economics or politics or government, or mm -hmm. if it's something we, you know, should exclusively aim towards in the end of life, right? As something that is only in its, in, in its perfection with God and directly in God's presence. Um, I may not be using the right words there, but I'd be curious for your thoughts on that as the kingdom is something we are creating here and now, or is the kingdom mm -hmm. just something that we're aiming for through a life of heroic virtue and, and the journey to sainthood? 
Hmm. Mr. Ferro, you want to go first? No, why don't you go first this time? Okay. Uh, I would absolutely insist uh, that Jesus is dead serious when he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we have a solemn obligation to attempt as much as possible uh, by every legitimate means available to us uh, uh, to build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Uh, that, uh, the, that doesn't mean utopia, of course, uh, but what it does mean is that we have to take very seriously our need uh, to live out uh, the the virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. And we really need to take seriously our obligation to share those gifts that God has given to us, both spiritual and material. Uh, and by the way, uh, I think that this does absolutely involve uh, the state. This is heretical in some uh, places, but in fact, uh, the church's teaching is that subsidiarity uh, means that uh, the people clo closest to the problem should handle the problem typically, but there are, are problems that, ca that cannot simply be handled at the local level. Uh, and so it is, it is necessary for us uh, to move up that ladder uh, of authority and responsibility sometimes uh, to do, you know, so climate change, for example, is not something that's going to be solved uh, by some guy in his mom's basement, you know. Uh, and the pandemic is, is something, you know, this is how Ebola was handled. Ebola was handled by an international effort of state and technology uh, to tackle the problem. And so has the pandemic been. And that's normal. Uh, shockingly, when I was researching my book, uh, uh, The Church's Best Kept Secret, one of the shocking things that I discovered uh, was that uh, Francis uh, in uh, Laudato Si quotes Benedict, who himself is citing John the 23rd, who says that for some problems, what is necessary, and I'm quoting here, is a true world political authority. There's something to scare the daylights out of <laughs> every libertarian in the church. But that's reality, of course, is that there are some problems that really do require that. And the church, in fact, was born in a world that had a world political authority. So it's used to living under those circumstances. Uh, but the idea s still remains, of course, subsidiarity. What we don't want is a true world political authority that's in charge of you know how much gravel you put in your in your uh, driveway and you know all those sorts of things, but at the same time, uh, it's it's really necessary for us to think in terms of our personal responsibility for everybody else. Uh, uh, John Chrysostom famously says that uh, the 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 rich exist for the sake of the poor. But then he goes on and he says something shattering, uh, something that I think about almost every day. He says, the poor exist for the salvation of the rich. Uh, just as we are given gifts and charisms to be able to uh, you know, carry out our particular mission, one of the things that we're given is material wealth. Uh, and we are going to be held very, very responsible for what we do with it uh, and the way in which we treat the least of these. So. Professor, over to you. Well, um, I would say it's a, it's a great mistake to to talk about building the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Um, first of all, the mistake that some people make is to think that the kingdom of heaven is not about earth, um, as if there were 
or were to be a kingdom somewhere uh, else in some presumably spiritual realm uh, that didn't involve the good creation that God brought into being. Um, so some people do make that mistake, and and uh, they tend not then to think of doing anything that contributes towards the kingdom other than shaping souls, presumably their own soul first and others uh, as well. As Augustine said, we have to aim in the neighbor at what we aim at in ourselves, which is to love God above all things. Um, but that's about as far as their thinking goes because they're working with some kind of dualistic understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. The other mistake is to suppose that uh, that having recognized the f the flaw in that, that it must be the case that it's our task to make this world as like its final state, uh, the state that Peter talks about as being that of the new heavens and earth, uh, as we can here and now. And of course, there's an important uh, moment of truth in that. Um, but that kind of thinking tends to underestimate the nature of the problem and to underestimate the um, the necessity of the grace of God working not merely through nature and natural gifts, but working through the cross and the resurrection, and indeed through the ascension and the parousia of the Christ. So... Um, as I've tried to describe uh, as as well as I know how in in Ascension Theology and in Chapter 6 on the politics of the Eucharist, um, it's important working with the Fathers and working with Scripture to, to understand that the advance, the progress of this age uh, is a progress at once in good and in evil. It's not, it's not a progress that sees good grow and evil diminish. It's a progress that sees evil grow along with good because evil is parasitic on good. So there can't be any question of aiming at something approximating a utopia. Uh, the kind of thing that goes wrong when we do that is the kind of thing that's going wrong at present in this in this uh, pandemic, which uh, which uh, has been mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, again, in order to explain that, I would need to go into some detail. But I think it is evident that in our search for um, making this pandemic the last pandemic and in providing a universal vaccine and vaccination system, in which uh, the state will know how much gravel you put in your driveway and when you do it. Uh, all of that is a sign of our um, being being uh, sold out to a vision of progress and of kingdom building, which is not at all biblical and not theologically sound, and is doomed to failure as it has at every attempt to, uh, at it, whether we're looking back at the uh, Third Reich or at the uh, communist utopia or any other place where utopianism has been has been attempted. So I don't think it will do just to say, well, of course, we're not in, aiming at utopia. We're just aiming to get better and better. Th that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is is out of, you know, it's a cop out. It, it doesn't deal with what actually happens in history and what we've seen happen and what we're seeing happening around us at the present. Wow, it's been uh, such a rich discussion. Um, before we close, I want to pose one more question to you both about, um, you know, our, our contemporary circumstances, um, you know, in, in a broader, uh, longer term kind of kind of perspective. Um, what what do you think are, are signs for optimism and some of the, the greatest threats to uh, progress as as you both understand it? Uh, signs for uh, of optimism for me, uh, uh, I think, are uh, all around. I see um, uh, people paying more attention to the common good. 
and that is really something that is uh, essential for us as, as, as Catholics. I, I mentioned at the beginning, we are none of us saved alone. Uh, so the Catholic conception of salvation is essentially communal. Um, we are members of the body of Christ. We're not simply baptized into Christ the head. We're, we're baptized into the body of Christ. We become members of a God who is, as G.K. Chesterton says, a kind of a holy family uh, because he's a Trinitarian God. But more than that, we become, as uh, Paul calls us, members of one another. And that is something that uh, I think that is a contested issue in our time, at least here in the United States. I, I'm, I don't know what the situation is like in Canada, uh, but in the United States, there is a, a, a very strong current of libertarianism uh, that has... I regard what is I, I regard as a, a vision of the human person that is fundamentally incompatible uh, with the Catholic vision. Uh, it claims to be about individualism. What it really is about is uh, the privileged learning how to game the state so that they don't have to pay attention to their responsibility to the least of these. Uh, and that is something that the Catholic uh, vision of the human person is fundamentally incompatible with, that we must be uh, about the preferential option for the poor. We must be about uh, the least of these. And certainly, of course, uh, the church's teaching emphasizes our individual responsibility before God, uh, uh, our need to actively and personally pr pursue holiness. That's what subsidiarity is about. Um, but that fundamentally individualist uh, approach to the faith is something that I think cannot stand uh, and something that is now being challenged by people who are kind of groping their way toward uh, a more communal, uh, communitarian uh, understanding of their relationship with the rest of the human race. And I count that as as a win for the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in the world. Professor Farrow? Yes. Um, well, optimism and pessimism are, I suppose, um, character traits. Um, theologically, one does not want to speak of optimism, but of hope. Um, nor indeed of pessimism, uh, but of a realistic understanding of the human condition and of the threats to uh, human welfare, both in this world and in the world to come. Uh, when it comes to uh, signs of hope, uh, ultimately, we don't need more than what we were given in the incarnation and in the resurrection. Um, of course, we have to learn to live that faith in the midst of a world where people are um, often very much in despair, um, not merely pessimistic, but in despair. Hope is the virtue uh, to which despair is the corresponding vice. And theologically, we need to ask ourselves and help other people to uh, think about the, the difference between optimism and hope and between um, pessimism uh, or gloomy outlook on this or that aspect of life and actual despair. In terms of, of um, signs of, of hope, well, every genuine, uh, every genuine uh, conversion or any genuine um, 
increase in the building up of the body, uh, such as Paul discusses in Ephesians 4, is a, is a tremendous sign of hope. And in, in Philippians, he encourages us to dwell on such things. It's not a matter of individuals versus the community. It's both and and, and, and uh, never merely either or. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to signs of despair, uh, I, I see plenty of that. Um, uh, we've, we've had an awful lot of, of um, uh, manifestations of despair during this, this past year and a half, um, but there's a deep despair that has been at work in Western civilization in particular uh, since the wars. And uh, this is still working itself out in the destruction, the willful destruction of our civilization. And I think it's also wor- working itself out in the, in the deep and irrational fear of COVID uh, and the willingness to credit almost any kind of lie in order to try to get out of the threat that we experience with COVID. Um, so they're, they're, they're deep signs uh, of despair, but they're also, of course, wonderful signs of hope in the advance of faith in, in, in communities and individuals. And that is certainly what we need to uh, cultivate if we wish to, um, to think and act theologically. I think hope is um, about the best possible way I can think of in uh, hitting the apex of this conversation. Um, and uh, I, I think, too, Professor, you point out very well that, you know, the plan of salvation is still being worked out in all its beautiful, glorious, messy details. And so uh, uh, for joining us on this little waypoint on that uh, journey of hope, uh, Mark, Professor Farrow, we're both uh, extraordinarily grateful to you for joining us, taking some time out of your very busy lives to, to share your insights with us. Um, before we get to the closing prayer and wrap up, um, I just wanted to give you both an opportunity to take a minute and plug for the audience any projects you're working on. So we chatted before um, the conversation started, but I'll share a link in the chat, Mark. I know your latest book, uh, The Church's Best Kept Secret, just came out last year. So uh, there mm-hmm. is a, a New City Press link in there for those who are interested in, in going further. Um, any other uh, projects you're working on that you want to share with the audience, Mark? Uh, well, I'm an ongoing blog. Uh, you can read that at markpshea.com. I'm working on a couple of books. I'm writing a book on the Creed, and I'm writing a crazy novel, uh, which will eventually, uh, <laughs> hopefully, see see print. Uh, so, yeah, check out my blog, markpshea.com. Awesome. I look forward to reading that. And what about yourself, Professor Farrow? I know you have a byline in a number of different publications, but anything you'd like to share with the audience? Well, uh, I, I am, of course, I'm happy to encourage people to pick up, if they can, a copy of my theological commentary in the Brazos series on First and Second Thessalonians, where I try to think about some of these things by thinking along with Paul in those earliest of his letters and um, and working out some of the theological implications of of what he says and. Uh, uh, today I've been uh, trying to finish a, a paper pursuant to that uh, project in, in which I deal a bit more closely with uh, Giorgio Agamben, but uh, it, it, that that's probably not something that uh, your audience necessarily wants to know about. Uh, get the commentary and, and begin reading, and, uh, and I hope uh, that uh, people will find that uh, helpful and profitable. Thank you so much. And and thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm going to now do a few quick, short Catholic conscience plugs. So um, I've just shared in the chat, or I will share in the chat right now, um, a link to our newsletter. If you enjoyed uh, tonight's conversation, um, we have a Catholic civic workshop pretty much every month. We're now getting into the habit of doing a couple of these every month now. Uh, and so if you're interested in getting all the updates on, on upcoming guests and programs that we're working on at Catholic Conscience, Sign up for the Catholic Commons, which is our newsletter, and and you'll get all the details. I'll also quickly share a link to the Eventbrite page for our next uh, webinar. Um, We've organized and are starting a uh, webinar series on the beauty of creation. And we're really excited for this series because it's a wonderful group of Catholic philosophers, natural philosophers, scientists, theologians, 
that are just going to speak to different topics about uh, the order of creation, mankind's place in it. Um, and I think it's just going to be a wonderful, interesting, for, especially for folks who enjoy the intersection of faith and science and reason, mm -hmm. I think we'll find this to be a really fascinating webinar series. Um, and I'll also say quickly for the Canadians that are watching, um, as you, as many of you will know, there's a lot of speculation that we're going to be having a federal election sometime soon, for better or worse. But um, uh, many of you know we'll do we do at Catholic Conscience um, for elections a Catholic action campaign with lots of different resources to help educate and encourage greater Catholic voter turnout and more educated Catholic voters, particularly through the lens of Catholic social teaching. So once again, sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye out for, if we do have an election, we'll be publishing all our materials, comparing party platforms through the lens of Catholic social teaching. So lots of great stuff if you want to discern prayerfully and thoughtfully your vote in the next election. Uh, and with all of the plugs now out of the way, uh, I'm going to invite Matt Marquart, our president and founder, to join us on screen for a little closing reflection and to lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you, Brendan. Um, and thank you, Mark and Professor Farrell. Um, those were really uh, very deep thoughts and I think extremely apt and relevant to our current um, social situation. So I want to just close very briefly with just a further refinement on the challenges and the hopes. Um, so the challenge, of course, is that it seems to me anyway that it's not possible really to lead anybody <clears throat> as a as a government or a president or a prime minister without having some sort of social agreement on what progress is. A lot of things flow from that. I think everything flows from that. Like what is the definition of poverty? I don't think you can define poverty unless you know what pro um, progress is. And I would say that the social concept of progress is very fragmented right now. I look at a lot of party platforms for our election guides, and I will say that with few exceptions, most of the parties seem to look implicitly at gross domestic product as their sole index of progress. I think there's a slowly growing awareness that that's not necessarily true, which is a sign of hope. Um, but it's to the extent now that some of the parties are actually talking about the importance of making sure that every woman is able to work in order to maximize gross domestic product without any consideration of whether having both spouses work in all cases is a really good idea for children in the future. So I'd say that's a challenge. But signs of hope include the fact that some parties are now starting to pro uh, propose wellness indexes of various types, but I think possibly those are a good thing to consider. And also the ultimate sign of hope is that we still live in a democracy in which in the course of a single election, we can change the entire landscape if we just think about the issues and uh, encourage the kinds of candidates that we think are appropriate and support them. And so with that, um, I will go to a prayer. I'm gonna adapt a little bit of prayer that Archbishop Mullen of Regina, uh, I go back to this a lot, but it's a beautiful prayer. He, he um, actually wrote this for us in the last uh, Saskatchewan provincial elections uh, last year. So. If everybody will maybe join me, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, Father of our human family, your Son Jesus taught us in the parable of the Good Samaritan <clears throat> that each of us is called to care for our brothers and sisters without concern for our differences and what divides us. And you taught us in the Gospel of Matthew that we are called to use the full range of gifts that have been entrusted to us for the purposes of the, the owner of the vineyard, which is to love one another. And by doing that, to grow in our likeness to God and progress in our closeness to God. We ask that you pour out um, your spirit upon each and every one of us and give us, and all involved in our future, a spirit of humility to acknowledge our failures, a spirit of gratitude for each of the gifts you have given us, a spirit of wisdom to guide our actions in accordance with your teaching, a spirit of fraternity so that we might have concern for the most vulnerable and the spirit of love, so that we might abide even more fully in you. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound community of your divine life, grant each and every one of us a deeper sense of unity. Give to us a desire to sacrifice ourselves for our brothers and sisters. Help us to live like your family did, with simplicity, 
and as the early Christian community did, whose charity is spread throughout the world. Good Shepherd, Christ the King, you are our guide. Continue to guide us then to your will in this and in every moment of our lives. Our Lady of the Rosary, St. Joseph, St. Joan of Arc, St. Juan Diego, St. Kateri, St. Marguerite, St. Andre, and St. Vincent de Paul. Pray for, pray, us. pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Brilliant conversation, guys. Thanks, Amen. Thanks so You're much. And thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And, and thank you to the audience for joining us as well. And uh, have a great one. And we'll see you all very soon. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.